this one. Let's do that. Thank you, Craig. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. So if it's your first time here, whether you came to see hi to Heather at Christmas time or not, uh, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. <clears throat> Excuse me, let's get the frogs out of our throat. As Craig mentioned briefly there, at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A button. Feel free to use that, especially for questions. Uh, you can use the chat, but as you've seen, the chat moves really, really quickly. So we keep the chat for that conversation and keep it going. You're very welcome to keep the conversation going in the chat. And if you have a specific question for any of us, pop that into the Q&A and Craig will track that this morning for us. As always on a Friday morning, it's important to us to pause for a moment and play our very, very small part, but to recognize and acknowledge the land where we are. We uh, were chuckling, those of you who came on very early this morning, that we're having a technology issue. So this week has been Rock the Mock week, which was introduced to me by our good colleague, Lauren Bishop. I'm not sure that she could be here this morning, but she was telling us about it at the beginning of the week. We went on a little learning journey and found a beautiful video. It's just a minute that explains it far more elegantly than I can. <clears throat> and they don't have a frog in their throat either. <clears throat> but unfortunately, that video is not working this morning. So in a sentence, Rock the Mock is a global awareness pretty much in North America at the moment. But the aim is certainly for it to grow bigger than that. And actual Rock the Mock, as in Rock the Moccasin Day, is November the 15th. We will pop the link to that YouTube video in your follow up materials. And as you'll learn in there, <clears throat> excuse me, the importance of the moccasin. And it allows our indigenous people to walk on the earth without harming the earth. And there's so much more behind it than that. So I encourage you, even though the week will be over, take a minute, watch the video, learn a little bit more. For all of us here in Calgary, and that is where state's main campus is, we acknowledge that we are situated on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy. Today, that area encompasses the indigenous people <clears throat> of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta. The Zixika, the Bakani, the Gaini, the Sutina, and the Stony Nakoda First Nations. They include the Chiniki, the Bearsport, and the Wesley First Nations as well. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Perfect. Thank you, Jenny. I'll give you a second to mute and clear the throat. There you go. Mm -hmm. um, so we are... Uh, very fortunate to have Heather McMillan joining us this morning. Uh, folks, there's great background on Heather's bio in the, in the Zoom link, and certainly feel free to reach out, connect with her on LinkedIn. Heather uh, has a great uh, background in leadership, leadership development, talent development, and we're very fortunate to have her now having joined our uh, adjunct facilitation pool here at SAIT. And so Heather's going to join us this morning and have a great conversation with Jenny about uh, conversations. Um, you have a ton of them every single day. I'd be curious to see in the chat if you think about how many conversations you actually do have. Um, I don't know if you've ever stopped. I don't know if I've ever stopped to contemplate what that number might be. But um, and how do you how do you leverage your conversations? How do you change your conversations to perhaps level up your leadership or change your leadership? So I think we will start there. There's going to be a ton of direction that we can go. Of course, please do throw your comments in the chat. I will keep an eye on it. Please, if you've got specific questions as they come up, try to throw them into the Q&A. Makes it much simpler. But with that, um, Heather, Jenny, Heather, I guess we'll come to you to start with conversations. Right? Yeah, We're going to sit here and have one, but sure hang <laughs> yeah, up at the great. end of this and, and then go on and have many more today. So yeah, no, thanks. And thank it's it's great to be here with with you and Jenny. It's it's going to be fun. I know. Um, yeah, I think when we were thinking about this session and the topic and, and what we could talk about, we think about conversations that is leadership, right? When you think about leadership, that's your currency, that's your medium is conversations. And so when we think about having conversations, how do we really level them up? How do we get the most out of them? And maybe you resonated with some of the questions we asked in the description, like what would it feel like to step out of firefighting mode and enable your team members to uncover solutions? What would it feel like to take vacation knowing that your team can do whatever comes up, can handle whatever comes up? How many of you out there would love for that to be the case? And so we want to 
you know, have a conversation about what it, what, what's one way you could do that and by taking a coach approach. And so that's really where we want to spend some time today. So as you step into this conversation, think about what are the, what are the things on my plate today? What are the conversations I'm going to have? And, and how do, how can I apply some of what we're going to chat about today? Some of you probably have some great ideas too. Um, and maybe a lens to think about. I always like to think about how do you expand your leadership? And I think being more coach-like is one way to do that, right? How do you make bigger those conversations, your leadership, your team members? Because um, you have that potential as a leader. Uh, you also have the potential to contract, right? And so how do we, how do we really expand? So, yeah. Let's, um, let's play with that coach piece for a minute. Because yeah, I still do it. do it, even to this day. Somebody says coach approach, and it rhymes nicely. We like that. Yeah, great. <laughs> we love tools. That, that and acronyms and a little bit of alliteration in our day is made. Yeah. But, but this is really cool because it, I like what you said there, that it can expand leadership. Mm -hmm. But in, in a lot of people's heads, you mentioned the word coach, and, and it depends on who you are, your story. But some of us have gone back to perhaps our sporting days, mm -hmm. and that's not the definition of coach that yeah. we're talking to and then in my head as well I'm like there are some very brilliant people who have worked exceedingly hard yourself's one of them to get pretty decent qualifications around being a coach mm -hmm. and now we're talking about leaders who are doing their job having conversations all day that vary in like what do we mean by coaching as a leader can you just play on that for me just to yeah. a little bit yeah yeah I think that's a really important distinction too, because, well, I'd be curious, like what, what do the rest of you think when we say coach, like, what does that mean to mm. you? Um, because as a leader, we all know we're having conversations all the time and the way we approach that conversation, you can either kind of be, there's a, I think of it as a spectrum, right. From like, I'm telling you what to do, being much more directive to the other end of the spectrum where I'm really asking you questions, believing that you have the answer yourself and using that coach-like approach, which we're gonna talk about, what does that actually mean? Because I think there's different components to it. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's also knowing that as a leader, you're not always gonna be in coaching mode, right? We're not, we're not talking about you being a professional coach and just strictly coaching. Yeah, you have to be aware of the different <laughs> situation. What does the conversation require from you? There might be times, like, for example, in a career development conversation where you're doing more coaching, right? You're leaning more on some of those, those asking and being curious and listening skills. But there are other conversations where you might just be pulling in those skills to support and to take that conversation to open it up and to make it bigger. Right. So I think it's it's very situational and that's your job as a leader is to, OK, what what is the conversation require? What's needed here and how do I lean on those skills to be able to to expand the mm -hmm. conversation? Yeah, a couple a um, couple of interesting comments here from uh, Deanne and Tim. Um, coach like leader. Sorry, I talked about a coach like leader and holding people accountable and giving feedback versus feed smack. Sorry, that's the piece that. I was trying to get to. I just, I love that. That's a, <laughs> a terrific line. That um, is great. Right? There is an, amount, an element of accountability in here, and there's something that you touched on that I, I want to come back to. But Tim's comment here too, coach-like sounds less structured mm. and more fluid, more generally supportive, and perhaps a broader perspective. Is that kind mm. of what we're talking about here? Yeah, I like we're that. Coach-like versus coach yeah, versus coach. Coach like being, um, I like the fluidness of it because it, it's not, you don't necessarily, if you're being more coach like, you're asking, you're probably asking more questions, right? So you don't always know where things are going to go. And you're being open to that, to, to following the lead of the other person. Um, I, I think one of the things maybe we can dive into is oftentimes when I hear train or we go to training about coaching, et cetera, we get into, we hear some of the common themes like asking questions, listening. I think there's something that's really important when you think about uh, stepping into a conversation and that is how do you actually see that person, right? Because a difference in being coach-like is that I don't have all the answers as the leader, 
right? But I see you as capable and resourceful and, and I trust you that you are gonna be able to find the answers. And I think sometimes what I'd be curious to know from, from people out there is, is when, you went, when you started your leadership journey, what was your perspective around the expectations of you as a leader? Uh, I know for me, just getting into leadership, you know, often like I was, I felt like I needed to have all the answers, right? That yeah. if if people come to me, I should have the answers. And I had to work through that's actually not the most empowering perspective to hold as a leader. But how do I look across and say, no, you actually have the answers. Uh, you're capable of finding them. I trust you to find them. And you probably have better answers than I do. Uh, so how do I support that? So I think it's the perspective and the mindset that we we see, that we take into conversations that makes the, the biggest difference. Absolutely. Jenny. <laughs> I saw the look. I know, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. And well, the look was good. I have loads and loads of thoughts around and it's it's all cool and then I think okay that's excellent and you ask the question and you're met with deer in the headlights mm. um that that's where part of my look probably was because I'm thinking yeah you totally you trust that person you hold them capable we talk about that a lot don't we capable is you know the minute that we do that we shift from that yeah sort of power relationship which is healthy like to hold them capable there's a reason they have this job and then they don't give you the answer that you want and yeah. and I think what you said that was brilliant because you have to be okay with that yeah and I think that's probably quite difficult and I think the overarching piece in here which I, I really appreciate is what's your mindset entering into yeah. that conversation yeah, yeah. and we talked about earlier today, we jump from conversation to conversation to conversation to conversation all day. And I'm not sure that we're all very good at changing the mindset or transitioning between those conversations. So I appreciated that. You've got to take a point and just reset almost as you yeah. begin the next one. I think that's tricky. Yeah, um, I think you're right because we're we're going so fast. I'm like meeting to meeting to meeting that we don't pause and set our intention and check to see how am I seeing this person? What is my mindset right now? Mm -hmm. What is my perspective on their capability? And I think for me going through coach training, that, that was the thing. I, I started seeing the whole world different. I started seeing people different, right? Because it wasn't, it wasn't about what I, I could bring, but it's like, what, what do they have, right? Yeah. How do I get, um, leverage all of the skills, the abilities out of this person, right? That they bring this uniqueness. It's a, it's a different mindset, I think, than, you know, the control and command type <clears throat> leadership style of, I need to know all the answers and my job is to give instructions and to get things done, right? But when you shift that perspective to, oh, well, I have a team full of capable people and how, do, how am I seeing them? Because if you see them differently, new things will open up, new possibilities will exist for that person. Yeah. And when we expand like that too, sorry, no. <laughs> what's really cool is immediately we're seeing, we're seeing what they are capable. We're seeing their strengths. And this is, this is where I think it gets difficult because what we have to do is let those boxes of the dreaded job descriptions go fuzzy yeah. and allow our team to flourish where they can and will grow and flourish and I think we've spent a long time and in, in fact it's a it's kind of a hangover that we still have this is your job and this is what you do and if yeah. you don't do that then we won't reach this performance that we want which is in fact rubbish if we've got a team and we know what we're aiming for there's so much as you said to be gained mm -hmm. from finding that out and building yeah. on that and and you know it's, we have to grow in your weaknesses no you can grow in your strengths. You yeah. absolutely can grow mm. in your strengths. But that's fun. Yeah, and right? That lights a fire. And that's, you know, neither you nor I would say we are the best that we can be in what we do. We've so far to go. Yeah. But it's fun getting better. And, and I think we forget that sometimes in the hurry of work. Yeah, yeah so your, for sure. Your comment about strengths, Jenny, I just want to come back to a comment in the chat from... Our wonderful Dean of the School of Business here at St. Janet Sagala. Oh. Janet, thank you. Um, but talking about the coach approach is understanding employees 
bringing different strengths and expertise to the table. A coach approach is getting to know people in a way that allows you to bring those strengths together that makes the team successful. It's right? so such a such a really good point. No wonder that school is ranked one of the top 50 business schools in the world. It is, Sorry. Right? It is. And I've had the privilege of, of being uh, Janet as my leader who demonstrates this um, yeah. really well, right? Very yeah. inspiring. Yeah. Um, and a couple other really good points here too that I wanted to highlight. Uh, Tim, the, the comment about this sounds a lot like overcoming of ego and arrogance. Nobody has all the answers and trusting the team to do the right thing even if the leader doesn't understand that. I think that's an interesting comment about if the leader doesn't understand or the leader doesn't agree is an interesting, because mm -hmm. there's different approaches, obviously, right? Yeah. I think, the challenge, I think the challenge leaders might have is when you are asking or taking that coach approach and you are seeing folks come back with answers that you think probably aren't gonna quite get there or are missing the mark. For me, I, I wrote down here, is there a time to tell somebody what to do and how to do it versus trying to lead them to what to do and how to do it? And where does that play in with sometimes letting somebody fail as well? So, so yeah, those are, those are great uh, points there, Craig. I think, yeah, there's a time, this goes back to that situational leadership, right? You're not always going to stay in like, coach approach, just asking questions. There's a time and a space depending on, you know, the skill set of the individual, the, the risk of the situation, all of those things that you're taking into consideration. There might be a time where you're being more directive, right? You're on that other end of the spectrum where you're, you're more telling or guiding might be somewhere in the middle there. And so I think as a leader, you're, you're constantly <laughs> evaluating um, what approach is going to work in this situation for this person? Um, I don't know if it, people would agree with me, but I think the tendency for most leaders is to lean a little bit more to the directive side than to lean towards the, the, the coaching side. I don't know. What do you think, Jenny? And again, the situational, <clears throat> what we hear is a lot of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because it's quicker. And because I think the demand and the pressure to achieve the number is suffocating for a lot of people. Yeah. And so that's that's easy. And so that's that's a bit of a culture piece. Depends where you are, who you're working with, those kind of areas. But I think there's something really important here that it's a skill set that we miss a lot. And that's that curiosity. And yeah. how do you ask a good question? Because the minute that somebody doesn't give you the answer that you want or that you're looking for, the tendency is going to be to lean into a leading question so that we can just get to where I want to get to. So we're yeah. back to that. Like, well, my job is to coerce you. Come this way, for goodness sakes. And actually, that's not what we're talking about here. So I'm wondering if we can lean in on that curiosity and that questions a little bit. How do we ask the right questions that open that up to help yeah. people see differently, maybe? Yeah. No, I love that because now, now, that, now we're talking about, okay, what are the skills that we need? We've talked about like, what's the mindset we need to really set, set the tone for the conversation or the possibilities for the conversation. But yeah, the skills uh, you, that we talk about often when we talk about coaching is asking questions and listening, right? So like, let's dive into the asking questions and I like ask expansive questions, right? You, you have so much opportunity to open up the conversation through the type of questions you ask. And so when you think about asking questions, you know, we have a spectrum of questions too, right? From close-ended, so you ask a question that gets a yes or no answer, yeah. right? Are you looking forward to the weekend, Jenny? Yes. Yes, right? Okay, that doesn't give me much, right? Yeah, Jenny's looking forward to the weekend. Right. How can we take that up a little bit uh, to open it up? So an open ended question. What are you excited about this weekend, Jenny? Well, I'm teaching for state tomorrow. True story. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. <laughs> right. You're getting a little bit more information from yeah. Jenny. Um, what is the most exciting or most interesting thing you're going to do this weekend, Jenny? The aim is to hit some of the Christmas markets. There you go. Yeah, yeah, right. So the way you ask questions, and I think 
<laughs> out of all the things in coaching school, they gave me a lot of things, but one very tactical tool that changed the way I had conversations was start your questions with what or mm -hmm. how. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. If you start them with what or how, it will just open it up. It will allow that person to give you more information, expand the conversation. Right. So often watch how many times you're asking a close ended question and just substitute what at the beginning of it and, yeah. and see what happens. Um, and the other thing about why uh, is, you know, why can be used sometimes, but generally why has this undertone of judgment, right? It's sort of like, which, like I should have done this. You say, don't shit on people. It's like, it, it has this under and, and it kind of puts people on the de defensive. So use it sparingly, but it substitute what or how into asking questions. Yeah, the why is an interesting one. And Jenny, I'll demonstrate it for you here is why are you excited about a Christmas market? <laughs> right. Like, sorry. Like, I'm just now you're judging me. That's right? judging yeah, me. I, I know. Actually, it's, it's more judging Christmas markets than it's judging Jenny. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> there we go. So yeah, you've got to pay attention to Roberta's capital letters there. She's not kidding. I know. I saw. <laughs> I saw it. it's all good <laughs> yeah. but that's a, that's a great example because you know even though if we were off screen I would happily fill you in on the whole Christmas market scene and actually yeah. I'm in trouble because I don't have much time this weekend for, for us to go there with our youngest who's at home but but that immediate that why you, as you put it Heather we're kind of we're pushed into a corner you're on your back foot you're defending your actions and yeah. even if the intention you know, okay Craig doesn't do the Christmas market thing the intention is why that like why would that be exciting the the answer is different than if you'd ask what is it that you like about the Christmas market scene or that that part exactly. there so yeah. I think that's really that's a very very cool takeaway is the what or the how yeah mm -hmm. and the other thing I would add though is once you've asked the question stop talking yeah. and that means we have to be okay with that pause why somebody actually thinks about the answer um yeah. and and we're not we normally just fill it with noise straight away no yeah we're what like on a scale of one to ten how comfortable are you all with silence in a conversation right so yeah. we are we are not our 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 conversations are not lent to, to, to creating that space. And you're right. If you've asked a great, powerful, expansive question, you, you want silence because silence is like, they're, they're like, wow, that's, I have to think about that. But the tendency when you're, you're trying to be more coach, like is to like, oh my gosh, there's, they're not answering There's space. I have to fill it with the next question. So then you start stacking questions on top of each other. And they're like, they they're confused right so yeah embrace that silence and and take it as a, a positive sign that they're they're thinking about it now you're going to be able to tell if they're truly thinking about it or if your question just really didn't didn't land um but yeah. it's but that I think, silent internal count to three that you need to be able to if you're if you're counting to 10 it might be getting a little awkward <laughs> right. right maybe Depending on, depending on how powerful your question was. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I think you're right. And, and I don't know if uh, our friend Janice is online, but she, I always think of the acronym WAIT, like why am I talking uh, that she first taught me. And I think that is a great thing to think about when you're trying to take a coach-like approach is why am I talking? If you're more in coach-like mm -hmm. mode, the other person should be doing more of the talking. Right. So assess how much am I hearing my own voice in this conversation and, and what what do I need to do in order to hear more of their voice? Yeah. Um, and we've talked about that in here a fair bit. That's voice share right there and that voice mm -hmm. share. And, and this is cool because you can take that from a one on one. You can also take that into a team meeting as well. And there's a there's a rhythm in that voice share as well. So having that awareness is cool. Um, it's funny, I, paced, I paid, um, posted something about weight in LinkedIn this week. And <laughs> why am I talking is the, is the classic one. And then the other one that I really like, though, is what am I thinking? Mm. And that ties back nicely to um, the mindset piece within there. Because 
if our mindset's not in the right place, what am I thinking? Craig comes up with his answer. If my mindset is not in the right place, I'm like, oh, you're not going the right way, mate. How am I going to get this pulled over to the way I want it to go? That's not going to help us. And it's definitely not coach. Exactly. Whereas if I catch myself, what am I thinking? Oh, I want to give you my advice, which is better. Okay, we can keep that all inside. There's no need for us to go there. And then that's given us that frame to change our approach in the conversation. So run the two side by side. Why am I talking? Love it. Okay, yeah. less from the leader in these conversations. And then what am I thinking? Use it as a little, you know, check in. Where's my mindset at? Because if I'm not holding you in full esteem and respect, our conversations change the dynamic already. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think he's touched on something else there, Jenny, around the advice, right? Like mm -hmm. wanting, wanting to give advice because th this is, I think, one of the most challenges, challenging things about being more coach like is the temptation to give advice, right? And uh, Michael Bungay Sanye talks about advice monsters. Great book. I'll give you the name of it at the end. Um, right. Because we all have these advice monsters that want to give people advice. It's a something that comes up and is how do you tame those? How do you in a conversation to what you're saying is how do you actually have the awareness to go? My advice monster is like right here and I want it to come out. Right. How do you how do you notice that and then get curious instead of giving advice? Um, he yeah. says, stay curious just a little bit longer. Right. Yeah, the book is interesting. It's blue for those who care. Um, oh, I can see it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> These two books. Um, but the TED Talk, for those who, who don't have time, don't want to read, the, here's a TED Talk. Um, we'll pop it into the resources as well. Fantastic. Yes. Um, it, yes, it's so, and it's one of those that you watch and you just, you swallow and you're like, oh, so guilty. Yeah. But once you're aware of it, it's kind of cool. Um, and I think Absolutely. the trap that leaders fall into is, it's it we really are paid a lot of the time to to have some of the answers to provide that advice like there are times where people come looking for advice they Absolutely. need it they're stuck um so i like that differentiation between it like sometimes we have to to sit on it until we're asked for it yeah um, yeah that's right yeah so there is a question here i'd like to from i'm thinking it's probably from my team so this could be interesting no i'm joking um but We've been talking a lot about us as a leader and how to kind of come in with a mindset and think yeah. about those conversations. If you are, the question basically is, what do you do when your direct leader is a command and control? So I'm going to take this from the standpoint of uh, you have a leader who is not coach-like mm. and it's probably, you know, do as I say like, if that can be a phrase. So and if you, I'm going to interpret this by saying, you know, if you're looking for more of that coach like approach from your leader, how can you pursue it? Hmm. It's a great, I think that's a great question and one that uh, <laughs> is very relevant for many people. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think, I, I think there, there's a couple of things that come, come to mind for me in that sometimes it's asking for, for what you want right? Um, and that's hard if there's been, if the relation, depending on the, on the trust in the relationship, but sometimes leaders don't know what they don't know, right? Or they, they, they aren't aware of what you need. And maybe, maybe it's having a conversation about, about that exactly is, is wanting more coach like conversations and what that could look like for the two of you. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's a tough one. Um, mm -hmm. And lots of times we we train leaders and the leaders above don't have the same training. And so we run into this where it's like, ah, I want to be more coach-like. Um, and it's also sort of leading up, right? How do you demonstrate what it looks like to be coach-like um, to your leader, to have conversations that are more coach-like? Um, I don't know, Jenny, what comes to mind for you? I think that's the, uh, yes. <laughs> agree um but i like that how can you model it upwards what and how questions period i get get more information from your leader but i think the other two things we have to be aware of sometimes leaders just don't know what they don't know and i think you said that heather yeah. but we've seen evidence of that recently where 
um, we were talking, I think the conversation was around providing feedback. I think that's what we were talking about. Feedback, feed forward, whichever you want to call it, or feed smack. I'm, I'm going to hang on to that one. Um, and, and this leader thought that her job was to be critical to be negative mm. and to be really firm and strong in that space almost parental or teacher like and and somebody really had the courage to step up to that and say mm. actually what i need here is mm. some validation and some recognition yeah. and i'm curious as to what it is that that stops that from happening i can't remember the exact words yeah and the leader literally her words were because i thought that was how i was supposed to be yeah. And so, you know, sometimes we just we haven't shifted in our mindset of what leadership actually means. And, you know, if in, we talked about this earlier in your story, everybody is command and control. That's all that you know. Yeah. And so yeah. that sometimes takes us there. And then the other one I think that pops up, well, you know, if, if you go to a leader who doesn't have a coaching qualification, hasn't been in any kind of professional development recently and you're I say you know I'd love a bit more of a coach approach in the back of their heads they've probably gone to well I don't know the first thing about coaching that's yeah. scary no way and so I like that idea of just you know be curious have the conversation and and make a request within there yeah yeah I think all those all those are great uh points and it's okay to ask for what you need right as, yeah. as yeah. One other thing, if we turn it around as a leader, is, is sometimes we go straight into a conversation and we think they want us to be telling them the answers or mm -hmm. to give them the solutions. And sometimes it's very powerful to just pause and say, what do you need from this conversation? Right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. that they can tell you what they need. I just need, I just need some like, I just need you to be curious and ask me some questions right now. Or you don't even have to use the word coach like approach if you don't right. Just yeah. I need you to be curious so that I can that I can find the answer myself. Um, yeah. 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 Lisa, great comment there. You have to be courageous enough to be vulnerable to ask for what you need. You do. Right? Yes. And so, you know, the thing that comes to mind here too, and I was going there in my head, Heather, is that if somebody were to come to me and ask me to be coach like and I didn't know how to do it. Yeah. You know, another, way you might, another way you might want to phrase that is, hey, I need a thinking partner on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Something like that. The other, the, and there's always the final option here, too. Uh, again, to whomever asked the question, we're talking about having conversations, right? So I think you have to go start that conversation. And then if your leader still isn't willing to take that approach, you do have a choice, right? Sometimes it comes down to whether you stay or whether you go. Hopefully that's the last option. Right. But you always have that choice. I know it's very simple to just say that and there's lots yeah. more behind it, but something would be that. I got a chuckle. Uh, Deanne, uh, your comment to be a coach like subordinate. I thought that was very cute. So thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> another I, question. I like that you just touched on courage and vulnerability because yeah. I, I yeah. believe in in whether you're the uh, the the leader or the person that's that's having conversations with the leader uh it takes courage and vulnerability to to change the way you have conversations right yeah. to try this out because if you've been a leader who mostly is on the directive end of things most mostly telling to change that is is going to take some practice right so it might not come really easily and it might not feel really natural at first but that's okay right if you just it this takes these are skills that you need to develop in order to to be proficient at them so sure. give yourself the space to develop them on both sides and any way you have conversations i mean go home and have conversations this way and you'll start changing the way the way they they are and those relationships I hear my wife laughing at me in the other room at the moment. So um, <laughs> you better go ask them what questions after this, Craig. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, and I, sorry. And it, something that always comes to mind for me is you as a leader, we touched on it earlier. We, leaders think they have to have all the answers. But if you want to change your approach, you might have to share with your team that you're wanting to do this, right? Yeah. And it will be awkward because. If you've been a leader of a group for a certain period of time and have behaved in a certain way, any sudden change without context may be construed as really strange and bizarre. 
Mm-hmm. So be goes back to that vulnerability. Be vulnerable enough to share with your team. I want to change my approach. I love that, Craig. Right? I think that's really important, right? Like is is being vulnerable enough. And maybe it's in a one to one setting, or it could be a team. But it's just like you know what? I've been learning a little bit about conversations as a leader, and I'm I'd like to try a different approach. So you're gonna maybe you know I'd love you to help me with that even, right? Yeah. Put it out yeah. there. Um, yeah. another. Another question we have here uh, that I want to see if we can put the lens of conversation on this in terms of how do you balance urgency with team building? I have to gather and aggregate info from many teams and then present it to get everyone aligned. What's the best way to attribute the contributions so people feel valued and comfortable contributing again in the future? So how do you balance urgency with team building? So obviously there's this need to gather information comes, there's a little bit of recognition in here, but there's a conversation in here in my mind that you need to be able to have with that group to talk about how you were going to do this, right? This may be one of those reset moments I'm thinking here of um, sharing your approach and why and what you were trying to do okay. and seeking feedback on whether you've, been able to actually I'm sorry I'm giving you time to think here so <laughs> and, and I wasn't employing the golden the, silence dead air on screen is not good for yeah. television yeah you'd have, you'd have caught both of our thinking faces in that Netflix pause that's yeah. so. right that's right um, the, the piece that stood out to me I'm going to have a dig into the specifics on it but is that recognizing contribution um and then I don't know that it's relevant to the question that's within here, but that productive response yeah. and recognizing contribution, that's crucial in any situation mm-hmm. and, and gets forgotten a lot of the time. Um, so that recognition, how does that fit into that big picture? Because when people feel valued, your, your team building happens quite naturally, as long as you're firm, fair and consistent across the board. That was my first thought. Heather, over to you. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I understood exactly what what the question was. To be honest, mm-hmm. um, because the the distinction between urgency and team building is that right, Craig? Yeah. 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 Um, I don't can, know. It goes back. Dig, to, yeah, so we can dig into it and think about it for for follow up messaging. Okay. Um, because there's one other question I wanted to ask here because it's an interesting okay. thing to me. I'm going to be selfish having the two of you here for a second. And so when we're talking about this coach approach and being curious, right? Curiosity is an interesting word in all this. Can you teach curiosity or is curiosity something that you naturally have? Ooh, my perspective? Absolutely. Curiosity is a skill. Um, it's a mindset. It's it's then followed, I think, by these skills of expansive questions, embracing the silence, and listening spaciously. Um, at least I certainly hope we can teach curiosity, or we might be in big trouble. <laughs> I don't know, Jenny. What do you think? I think it's both. Um, yeah. And I think I think there's a distinction here. I think there is a healthy curiosity. So I think that then that requires some learning. What are good questions? How do we avoid the um, the not so good questions? Let's just put it that way. So there's a healthy curiosity, but I think there's also a reckless curiosity. Mm. And I think what we see a lot is people hear the word curiosity. And Craig, you and I have laughed over a lot of words. It's like interesting. It just keeps coming up. And it's, yeah. <laughs> um, and then, and so that reckless curiosity is when we stack questions, we ask, you know, six in a row and there's no space for any answer or, you know, somebody sees it completely different to us, but we dive in in a ridiculously personal level to start with, rather than that healthy, you know, this is a different perspective. Can you tell me more or what else can you fill me in on? So, yeah, I would say that you can, you can improve your skills in it. Some people will gravitate to it perhaps a little quicker than others, but that can't be an excuse to not build on it. Yeah. And I think even, I love that healthy and reckless, right? teaching somebody what what does that actually look like right Mm -hmm. like what does healthy look like what does reckless look like is a skill that I think um you can develop uh it's not I don't think it's easy especially when you have all the pressures 
of you know work and teams and all all of the things going on but yeah and the other, the other thing we lean into too of course and we're doing it ourselves we talk about the skill of asking the questions but the other skill is listening yes and and that yeah. might be equally if not more important to your ability to be curious because when you listen properly oh, i don't know that i like that word but when you when you actually listen you're going to hear differently than if you're not and that's going to lead to a different question and that's probably the healthy connection in there i think absolutely and and i think lots of times the questions get a lot of the, the spotlight but it's like listening right how do you slow down um again like i say hush up because my mom never my mom told me i can't say shut up so we still say hush up right like why am i that like slow down yeah. Uh, and then level up your listening because there are different levels of listening. And if we think about like a level one, that's where I'm really just, I'm listening to you, but I'm just thinking of the next question I'm going to ask or, oh gosh, that reminds me of a trip I took or that experience I had, right? It's, it's really, if we had a spotlight, it would be really focused on me. Um, and then if we go into a, like a level two, what we would call is like, okay, I'm completely like laser focused on you, the other person. And the spotlight is only on, on them, which is, which is okay. But even better if we can take it one step further and sh kind of shine the spotlight on the whole conversation, yeah. right? So you're picking up on body language, on the nuance, mm -hmm. on your intuition. What, what, what do you feel in that space? Right. And you're listening at that level that's a completely different space to be than at level, level one listening. Mm -hmm. So how do you expand the way you listen to create more space there as well? I think that's a really important piece of it. I feel like I'm guilty of level one listening in these conversations because I'm watching the chat and the other <laughs> two, I'm waiting to ask the next question that, that's popped up here. Um, <laughs> but there's, I think it tied a little bit back to the, the conversation we have earlier. It's probably the last question we'll get in here from the audience before we start to wrap up. Uh, but uh, you talked about coaching up. We have a leader who doesn't take feedback well. Uh, they recently received negative feedback from an anonymous source, and they've taken a passive aggressive approach towards the person they believe provided the feedback and have disregarded it. It's a good setup. Is there a way to get the leader into a curiosity mindset so they can be coached through the feedback? That's why I'm glad we've got experts like yourself here too. Yeah, I mean, that sounds, that sounds like a pretty uh, complex situation. So yep. it's, it's hard to necessarily without getting all the information, but I'm not sure you, you, you can control uh, you know, this is where I would be saying, like, what's what's in your control in this situation? What can you influence? And then what are the things outside of your control? Right. And can you make somebody? I think that was the question. Like, can, can you basically can you, make a person be curious? I, I okay. you might be able to influence that. I don't know if you can control that. And yeah. um, is there so, a way to get them into a curiosity mindset? Essentially, is there a way? Yeah, I think there's two things. One is to remember that whenever we receive information like that, that we don't like, there's a there's a series of, you know, there's a time piece and, and it starts off with shock, anger and denial. Yeah. And some of us run through that in 30 seconds and we're done and we're ready to either accept it or or get rid of it. And some of us, it takes an awful lot longer than that. And the other thing, too, and we've talked about this a lot, leadership's a behavior, leaders, the title. And so if you have someone who's being passive aggressive to somebody else, and it depends on context, depends on your relationship, but I think there's an opportunity there to call in and, and call in. You don't want to call out anybody in public, yeah. but if you've got the relationship, just call them in gently and say, hey, I noticed this remark or when I hear this remark, you know, it came across as was that your intention? And that is a huge courage piece in there and i'm not suggesting you do that unless you've got sort of the psychological safety or the relationship within there but we do have that opportunity to to lead in the moment and you don't have to be the leader with the title to lead in the moment yeah, yeah. perfect okay this has flown fast uh, <laughs> yeah. 
Heather, I think we're going to have you back here again in the future because this has been fantastic. Yeah, I need, I'd love to. I think, I think we need to uh, move on to wrapping up with uh, the tips and picks as I'm looking at your uh, your your summary slides here. I like okay, this. I, just, I, can... I just noticed tips and picks, so I thought that was good. <laughs> or two, yes, two tips. All right, are you seeing, are you seeing it? Yes. Okay. We're good. Okay. My screens just went all crazy. Um, so yeah, I think going back to right, your opportunity is: Are you going to expand or contract the the conversations you have? And and things to think about as you think about expanding is you know how you see people changes what is possible. This is a picture of the woman who has made the most impact in my life. And when I think about seeing people and seeing them like this big instead of this big, it's her. It's my grandmother. And I think we could all like she was she wasn't a leader, but man, she taught me she taught me a lot, uh, a leader in the sense of in a corporation. Um, so consider what might be possible if you change the way you saw people. And over the next couple of days, like before each meeting or conversation you have with someone, ask yourself, how am I seeing this person? What's my perspective? What and then what perspective would expand the possibilities? Then if we get into, you know, the, the asking expansive questions. So start with what or how, not why. Keep them simple, right? Sometimes we, we end up, all of a sudden our question is this long. They only need to be nice and short and compact to have, to have um, power. Ask one at a time. So don't stack your questions and focus on the future um, as much as you can, right? That's where possibilities really expand. Um, slow down, <laughs> don't fake it. People know when you're being insincere or when you're just, you know, going through the motions, uh, create the space, um, you know, asking questions is great, but if you haven't created the environment that somebody really feels comfortable in responding to your questions, you're not going to be able to expand those conversations and your body language, right? Our body language is so important when we're asking questions and creating the space. Um, so, you know, watch, watch, and maybe get some feedback on how you're showing up in different conversations and your body language. Cause sometimes we're doing things that we, we didn't even realize, right. We weren't, wasn't in our conscious uh, mind. So here consider what opportunities are you missing because you are telling rather than asking what is one thing you will focus on to ask more expansive questions. And so this week, be intentional about changing your whys to what's. And like, how many times can you do it? Um, send us, you know, send me an email. Let me know how many times. Maybe I'll send the winner a, a book. <laughs> um, yeah, one of those books. That'd be great. Uh, so embrace the silence and listen spaciously, right? This requires us to slow down. I say, hush up. <laughs> Why am I talking? And then level up your listening to that, get to that level three where it's like there's a full 360 sort of view of, of how you're listening in the situation. So consider what could you gain by embracing more silence in your life and in your leadership? And what will you do to embrace more silence and listen more spaciously in your conversations? You know, one of the challenges I put out here is like spend one minute in silence before your day, like just where you're just sitting in silence and see what you notice. It's amazing when you do that, um, what, what might happen. Uh, one time per day, reflect on meetings, conversations, and assess how you embrace silence and listen spaciously and see how it, how it changes your conversations using these, uh, these skills. I think that's it for, for my slides. Perfect. Yes, and uh, that is excellent. Oh, so, I did put the books here, sorry. Yeah. No, um, that's okay. And yeah. we'll make sure we get those out in the, uh, the follow up as well. And um, perfect. If you could just pop to, the, you've got control right now, either. So if you just go one more slide. Okay. That would be great because we will be back again. Jenny and I will be back on December 2nd to talk about healthy tensions. Ooh. Ooh. That was, that was interesting. <laughs> yes. And then one more before the, uh, one more before the end of the year where we're going to kind of take a look back on everything we chatted about this year, maybe pick out some of our favorites and, uh, and go from there. But as always, uh, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Heather, thank you. That was fantastic. Yeah, thank uh, you. You're welcome.
It's great. Jenny, as always, thank you for everything that you do for these and uh, have a great weekend. And I know the Spruce Meadows Christmas Market is one of the top five in the world. I have been. <laughs> under duress, possibly. <laughs> the second time was under duress. The first time I went willingly. So <laughs> uh, with that, have a great weekend, everybody. Take care. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Thanks everyone. everyone. Bye.